everybody how are you episode 44 of run to the hills what's news gary i feel we've slightly overseen each other this week we've been very yeah we've uh, indulged or overdone i'm not too sure (laughs) (laughs) we've done a lot of interviewing heavy interview load this week but people are doing such amazing things and such crazy adventures and then we want to talk to them then you want to catch them when they're raw don't you yeah raw we've got come come off just come off the zoom chat with ross jenkins and uh he sounded like he had some pretty raw feet after his (laughs) after his big foot we might have to put one of those edits beforehand before when we put that one out of like if yeah. you don't like blister chat <laughs> but what have i been up to i have oh well did an amble side recce with uh a podcast a coaching client winner hannah and that was great we went from amble side to connison so we did the last section of the lakeland 50 or 100 and that was really good day nice nice weather i was joined by uh Bob Graham Neil and his wife Lisa. Um, and they're both doing the Lakeland 50 or 50 or 100. Mm. Well, they do it. So it was great for those guys to to do another recce. Um, I did my first weight session and yeah, I had a bit of DOMS actually. <laughs> which was, was it upper body, lower body? My my glutes and thighs and calves are kind of bum bum down and it was bum down. <laughs> <laughs> that technical gym term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because normally, you know, I don't like I, I do it at home, so I, I can't really lift heavy, heavy, but it's it's all kind of pre- pretty heavy dumbbells, single leg calf raises and stuff like that. Two but, kilograms, five kilograms. Yeah, max out there on a big bean tin. Um and but normally I don't get any doms. Um yeah. and I can train as normal, but yeah, I did feel yeah, I did feel like the next couple of days. So I'm I'm a bit unsure actually because I've got a Bob Graham round. Uh, support leg two and three on Saturday, Friday, Saturday, something. And do I do any more weights or do I not? Oh, just get back into it. Stop whining. Honestly, we're all fed up of it. Just yeah. get, you know, let's get those muscles back working. It was my daughter's birthday too. Um, so I baked a cake. Now, oh, any of our listeners know how to get a cake out of a bunting without it just falling into a million pieces? Let me know. Because, well, did you, did you? Grease the tin. Before I did, and I even so I greased the tin, and then I, I read I read somewhere that you take maybe I'd left it in a bit too long previous attempts, and then I saw an article where you could maybe dust it with flour, or another one said with sugar, like a caster sugar, and then you um take the cake out before the caster sugar goes cools down, and then becomes like really rock hard. But it didn't work, and the cake oh. came out in about ten different pieces. Um, <gasps> did you taste- sort of? Fudge it all together, but yeah, and good. Sugar. Thank goodness for ice and sugar because, um, <laughs> but a bun tin, you know, bun cake's lovely, it's got all the ridges and the lovely patterns, and we just like a smother ice and sugar all over it, so that wasn't sure she didn't mind. It tasted fine. We're still eating cake, and my goodness me, I'm creaking. <laughs> I'm trying to eat good, and it's not things are going against me, but what, oh, yeah, England match that was good. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, a little, uh, something people don't know about me maybe but i used to be quite a fanatic with england i i went talk about tokyo with a leash this show i went to japan to watch england play in the world cup which was fantastic i've been to my goodness me bratislava oh quite a few over gary are you one of those men in the stadiums when i say kids look away look away with your top off (laughs) overweight never took the top off (laughs) We used to run down the, I remember once at <laughs> Japan, we, we got a flag made up, me and my friend, um, and I had Sunland badge on it, and then Wingate, with the little village that we're from, and I, I could be remembering this completely wrong, but I'm pretty sure somebody from back home was like, there's a Wingate flag <laughs> in uh, Sapporo when England played, oh, goodness me, I'm forgetting who they played now in Sapporo, um, but that was pretty good, and I also overheard somebody behind me in the stadium <clears throat> basically saying, how can anybody afford from Wingate afford to come to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I used to I used to be quite a fan of football. And what is really it's not a football podcast, sorry, people. What's really sad is I can barely bother to watch it now and I'm not too sure what's happened. What is me. that because of the players or uh, the... yeah, I think every, just the money, the players' attitude, you know, the scandals and things like that. I just it just ground me down over the mm. years. And being a Sunderland fan, 
it's not been good watching. So maybe the two <laughs> things coincided. And, you know, getting older with family, your life gets a bit yeah. busier too. So that's me. Yeah, that is me. What about yourself? Have you, I know you've been busy napping all week. So Oh, look, for goodness sake, <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> You're always pestering me with things to do. And I'm like, Gary, it's nap time. Nap don't time. <laughs> me. But to be honest, I don't normally take my phone up for nap time for exactly that reason. But I think you caught me in an unscheduled nap. <laughs> Thing state. <laughs> well, you were working, apparently. <clears throat> Was I working? Yeah. Well, I went upstairs. <laughs> I forgot I told you that story. <laughs> Because my husband's still working a lot at home. And so we try not to work next to each other because we just end up like throwing stuff at each other or <laughs> being, um, or I annoy him when he goes, you talk so loud all the time. So I went, I said, I'll go upstairs and work this morning, which is fatal. Then you sit on your bed and then the sleep monster just comes in and goes, Ooh. just put your head down five minutes. That's all you need. You'll feel so refreshed. <laughs> and then like two hours later, I honestly believe I've been so, after having kids for 10 years of three kids, I'm sure I'm in such a sleep deprivation that I'll never, ever catch up on all the sleep that those little critters have taken from me. But I am very good at napping. And I literally, if I lay on my bed or if we drive anywhere, literally, if we drive like anything more than just five minutes down to care I'm asleep. I can't Don't do me. that. I can't sit down and nap it. Yes, That's it's been quite amazing. heavy napping, especially as I had my second jab. Oh, yeah, I had my second jab, and lots of people have had some nasty uh, what side effects um, yep. after it. So I was like, oh, so I crammed all my training, and then coach got mad because I put like three <laughs> sessions back to back. <laughs> and uh, I did run a three minute six k though. Uh, six uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Six seconds. Kilometer in my eight by one kilometer reps. Um, and what was your recovery on that? Because I did a One. five by three minutes and I did just over half a mile in, in three minutes. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, yeah, Eddie, you were moving on your session. That was good. Yeah, I like I like Yeah, I was I was moving. I um yeah, one minute. One minute, but I stand, I, I do it like heart rate and I really focus on yeah. Up in that hurry. Um, so yeah, I crammed my sessions in. Good sessions though. Race specific sessions. Love this point in a training block when you're like you feel really fit. You're doing race specifics, but you know, like you can only do a few weeks before race when you're that fit. Yeah. But about you know, you only got like that week, about two or three times a year when you feel that fit and you're not destroyed. And I did it to sort of cram those all in. Don't tell coach. He spotted, got a bit scared. But I, had, I didn't want to train hard for a couple of days after my jab. And um, no yeah. beer. You didn't get drunk and fall asleep. I thought of you because I went for a jog. I was like, God, I feel, I do feel like. I don't know. If you've had a baby, it's a bit like morning sickness when you just feel grotty yeah. and a bit fluey and just I didn't really want to be there. But anyway, I did a bit of light. I showed willing at my training sessions, but I slept like a baby. A two hour nap during the day. Oops. <laughs> that is good. Oh, I don't ever straight, remember doing that. And then I went to bed at 10, slept. I mean, I did get woken up by a dog at quarter past six, but good sleeping post COVID jab might ask for another one. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got one more week of training and then I'm into taper time for my Ooh. first race in a year and a half. This oh is going to be terrible. You're just going to explode out of the blocks, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to all go horribly wrong, but it's going to be great fun. 40K, almost 3,000 metres of climbing. Oh, brilliant. <gasps> it's going to be fun. Uh, let's just hope the weather clears up because we've just had rain, rain, rain mm, here that's... in the mountains. I know no one feels sorry for me because I yap on about living in the mountains. <laughs> Uh, right, let's see what's been happening. There's been some races. Oh, God, where's yeah. the States? Let's talk about that first. Yeah, well, Jim Wormsley wasn't a course record, but my he was on course record pace for quite a while, but I think the heat slowed everybody down a yeah, bit. Yeah, I think Beth Pascal was the same, wasn't she? She was sort of yeah. dipped under it and then but the that heat. Was close. You know what I noticed, actually? I watched the YouTube live feed they did, which was pretty fantastic. And when I do 100 miler, I can quite chat away quite merrily, unless it's going up something steep. These people were working. And I was so impressed. You could just tell that the guy who had his GoPro, whatever. You could hear them, couldn't you? Yeah. I thought guys. exactly that. I was like, you put us to shame because, uh, well, I'd be slightly 
anxious if I was breathing that hard during a yeah, hundred miler. Yeah. But then I was like, maybe I should be that working that hard in the hundred miler. Yeah. And talk, listen, I listened to Beth's interview when I run far. And she was like, she never put the foot off the gas. Yes. She would like push, push, push. And then if she got too hot, she'd like cool down and then she'd go again. The mental strength that that takes, because though there was all that coverage, the course is in the middle of nowhere. So yeah. she, and she didn't get any feedback. She said she didn't know how far she was ahead because yeah. there's no signal or anything. So you're just running scared the whole time. But it is a different race for the, like for someone like me <laughs> you know my goal would be say 24 hours so say for jim for argument's sake it's he's pretty much done 10 hours before mm. i am so maybe i do have to approach it so i'm not like full-on gas or that kind of marathon effort whatever so yeah it's, it's tricky to say what i should be doing maybe but super impressed yeah and kudos to all the women, 15 women in the top 30. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Beth was very diplomatic in her post-race interview saying it might have been something to do with the heat and the pacing. Uh, but I just also think it was a super strong women's field and that uh, maybe not quite as strong as men's field as there is uh, normally. And also maybe a lot of the men went out a little bit <laughs> That's not like the men, is it, to do that? I know, it's so <coughs> uh, So uh, Beth Pascal won that with your hands at a time in 17 hours, 10 minutes, the second fastest time on that course. Uh, and all the time I was thinking, I talked to Beth I know. on Zoom in the back room. <laughs> uh, I'll say it again, though. Any athletes out there who want to do well in a race? Come on the show. <laughs> we also had the Lakeland Five Passes Ultramarathon. Spencer Shaw won that in five hours 14 and Karen Nash in five hours 56, smashing times. Paul Nelson did that as well. I know I know he saw his name on the results. And uh, some friends of mine, uh, Chris Sears, helped on the Bob Graham round. Sean Kennedy helped on the Bob Graham round. And Ali Bailey, so oh. 18 Bob Graham round. They're all there. Whoa. Very good. Uh, and it was Hard wall, Hardwall's 40. Harry yeah. Holmes, six hours, 20, 12, and Sarah Chalans, eight hours, 27. This week, we caught up again with Cheer Charge sponsored athlete, athlete Alicia McCorgan after she announced that she'd been selected to run the 5,000 and 10,000 meters in Tokyo. She's at her high altitude training camp in Font Rameau, and we talked to her about the trials, her lead up into the trials, how she's training now, and we quizzed her on those all important questions on life in the Olympic Village and what the next few weeks was going to look like for her. So here's our catch up with Elish. How is, how is it with the altitude? Is it getting any easier? Uh, yeah, it's been tough. You know, even though, I mean, we do altitude training, obviously, quite a lot. Um, I was over in the States. Yeah, last time we spoke, I was at altitude. So, yeah, I'd like to think that it's easier. But every time <laughs> every time I come here, it's uh, it's just as hard. But it's, it's good in a way, because at least you feel like you're working towards something now. Do you know what I mean? When it is tough and it's... Um, the heart rate's high and the breathing rate's high. It, it, at least you feel like it's towards an end goal, like the Olympics are coming. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, certainly working hard for those anyway. How quick would you lose your, I'm asking all my questions already, how, how quick would you lose your adaptation? So you've, you've come down to sea level for a month. Is it kind of back to normal again or? Yeah, I think the physiologists say that we have, you have like almost a window where you can get your peak performance um, and I think you can feel the benefits right the way through to three, four weeks. But I think after that, then it, it does start to fall off, I think, quite quickly. So um, I assume after about a, a month, certainly two months, you're then back to, to where you were. Um, they do say that it does, you're meant to adjust a little bit quicker the second time round because obviously yes. your body should be, I suppose, acclimatized or used to it. But yeah. um that yeah I, that doesn't seem to happen for me i don't know if that's just no. an individual thing um <laughs> but yeah it certainly doesn't feel any easier for me second second third fourth time um i can i'd say my interval sessions and stuff are far improved so i'd yeah. like to think that's a, a knock-on effect from having been here earlier this year ah. it's like my approach to alcohol eddie it doesn't seem to get any easier the more i do it <laughs> build up gradually <laughs> 
Yes, follow Alicia's training plan, Gary. Um, drink altitude. Yeah, you get drunk really quickly, don't you? It's like on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> I don't drink, so I'm really boring. So I can't even add to that conversation, unfortunately. But I'm sure my does, boyfriend. Does, can yeah, does he? That. Does Martin have a beer at the end of the day when he's finished all your Instagram videos, and then go? Whoa, um, what's it all? So obviously, yeah, Michael loves a. A red wine and um I, yeah i'm just boring i just don't like the taste it's not like a health or athlete factor or anything it is literally just i'm a child and i don't like the taste of it um everyone always said to me that one day you'll like red wine and you'll like uh, olives and you'll like dark chocolate and you'll like yeah. coffee and tea and it's oh. i mean i'm 30 and none of that has happened yet so um we're still waiting we're still waiting for that day <laughs> i think i was about 25 until i had a cup of coffee and then it was like oh my goodness what have i, what have I missed out on <laughs> i think it's having children is the like i never used yeah. to drink like 10 cups of tea and then need cocktail hour every night until <laughs> i had done i'd done bedtime with three small children anyway leash let's talk about um what we really wanted to catch up with you about was uh the last sort of few weeks you're racing bonzana your incredible success at the european 10,000 meters um and now you're build up to the olympics i loved watching you run that 10,000 meters not only did i feel like obviously you were a personal friend right now as well <laughs> but uh what a race you ran were you you um super chuffed with the way that you ran that the result um and uh how did you cope with the pressure going into a race like that yeah i mean for me i was fortunate in a way that i had my qualifying time so that removes yeah. a lot of the um i suppose half of the stress of knowing that you need a time because that is difficult certainly over the longer events where we don't have a like few and far between 10,000 meter events happen um, in the world, never mind in the UK. So for me, going into the race and having the time was like a bit of a, right, we've ticked that box. That's a bit of a relief now. I need to just focus all of my efforts on coming in the top two. So uh, when the race started and obviously a couple of the girls set off to, to try and run the time, I suppose for me, it was a bit strange because your competitive instincts want to to win the race but at the mm -hmm. same time I knew that really my priority was coming top two against the British girls and even if that meant we were further down the field there was no need for me to to I suppose tax myself too much to try and get uh, under the qualifying but um, it just so happened we, we ended up running under the standard in the end anyway I suppose that the race between myself and the other British girls it started to heat up really quite quickly and over the last K we were really really shifting and certainly over that last lap we, we actually caught the the eventual leader um so yeah I, I was over the moon to to not only secure my space for for Tokyo but to win the race overall was a was a great feeling as well this it's not um as I said very often you get to run 10,000 meters and uh probably even less often than I've ever won one so yeah I came third in I think it must have been 2019. It was my first British Champs 10K. So to, um, at, sorry, the European Cup. So to come, yeah, overall winner of that entire race was a, a really good feeling. And even more so to know that I had done it. It's a lot of pressure on one competition. You have one trial race where you really need to be at your, your best and give everything you have. Um, so yeah, there was almost just a, a mix of emotions when you cross the line. You're excited. You're also just very relieved that yeah. it's done. Um, and yeah, it was it was a really cool moment. And your third Olympics, what an incredible achievement. And in three different disciplines. I couldn't find any other record of any other athlete in athletics that has done that. Yeah, I was going to actually ask. There's like a really good, um, there are a couple of people online that are good, like stat people. Oh, okay. And they know all this sort of thing. I thought, I'm surprised <laughs> that no one's mentioned this because usually they're on very niche stats. They all yes. know it. Yeah, um, that's it is, yeah, it is quite a niche uh, a niche thing. So I'll need to try and find out. As far as I'm aware, I don't, I don't know of anyone just yet. I know that people have done winter and summer Olympics. Yeah. Going to like the, say the long jump into the bobsleigh and things like that. But yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if someone competing at three games, um, consecutive games over different events. I think it's, it is probably quite unusual. You'll have women and men, sorry, that might compete um, over a 15 and then move up to the five and 10, but it's quite yeah. unusual for someone to do the steeplechase. And that's probably what makes things a little bit 
a little bit different. <laughs> How did that evolution happen though? You know, from the staple to the five and now the 10,000, was that a conscious thing or just, I don't know, you preferred certain um, disciplines at certain times? Do you know, it was, it was, it was forced sadly through injury. So I started the sport, um, as a steeple chaser, just because I, to be honest, in all honesty, I wasn't fast enough in the flat events. I didn't believe I would ever be quite good enough. And the steeple chase was like a new and evolving event for women when I was growing up. It had only just been sort of introduced at the, I don't know what it was, 2009 World Championships or something like that. And I remember sort of watching it on the TV and I was aware of the event because my dad was a steeple chaser, yeah. but it was an event that they must not have thought women could do so they didn't introduce it until later on and I remember watching it and thinking god I'd, I'd love to try that I'd love to do it I know my dad did it and it just felt like a a natural step that when we were allowed to start trying it around I must have been around 17 maybe where I did my first steeplechase and I just loved it and I suppose because it was a new and evolving event the standard was just naturally it sounds really bad to say it but it was naturally much lower because I it was in introductory almost into all these championships. So I and found myself really hard. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. And, and there is like a huge risk, I suppose, to injury as well. So a lot of the top class flat runners are not really going to want to take this risk to, to move to a, a 3000 meter steeplechase event when they're already running so well in, in the 1500 or in the 5k, yeah. it's sort of that middle ground, but with the added uh, risk of, of jumping over barriers, which as a flat runner is completely alien. It's different <laughs> if you're uh, a hurdler and you've tried it a few times, but yeah. in the distance events, there was nothing like that. So it was, um, I sort of just stumbled across it because I started winning races and competitions. And then within a sort of two year period, I realized that I could qualify for the Olympic games. Now I was nowhere near the standard to qualify for a 1500 or a 5k and the 10k was completely alien to me at that point point. Um, so yeah it just was the first event that opened the door to sort of elite professional athletics for me yeah. um, and I truly believed that would be the event that I would go to the next couple of games and I thought that would be it but okay. um, sadly in yeah 2015 I broke my ankle That's right. um, I had yeah two screws, uh, two plates, sorry, and uh, seven screws and a plate, sorry, in my left foot. Um, so there's a lot of metal work going on there, and I just I could not, I could run through the pain, I couldn't jump through it. I just yeah. physically and mentally just couldn't do it anymore. Um, so that's why we made the switch to the five k. It was a bit of a risk. I didn't think I was ever going to be able to do it, but. Okay. Um, that's, that's where the 5K came from. And the 10K is definitely a natural progression. As endurance runners, we sort of move up 5K, 10K, yeah. half marathon and marathon. So I have no doubt that the marathon is where I will eventually end up. But the, the steeplechase, as I said, was just a bit of a an open door event for me, really. Yeah. And going back to the European Cup, for an athlete like me, um, you know, I tip up during an event and I'll find the toilet queue and then, shuffle my way to the start line but for for you what what is the European cut what you know what, what would a, what the day look like I'm really curious kind of peep behind the curtain um I suppose it's a little bit unusual because of COVID regulations so um typically for like a European cup we are team GB so we all have to be in a hotel together there's like a a team meeting everyone obviously has their their meal together and then there's a team meeting afterwards where they discuss the different protocols for the next day but yeah. none of that actually happened although it did happen but a lot of the athletes didn't go because there was a lot of protocols yeah. to get in and out of the hotel there's also just the risk of perhaps sharing a room with another athlete and failing covid tests which result yeah. in, oh in quarantine goodness, so there's yeah. there was a lot of different things at play so none of that sort of uh normal team camaraderie was was there do you mean that didn't really happen yeah. um but yeah just i'm trying to think what happened on the day we had to arrive by a certain time again to get another covid test we had a covid test before we uh arrived yeah two days before we arrived then a lateral flow on the day yeah um and then me and my boyfriend were were split apart because they're not allowed to be anywhere near the athletes. So there was yeah. a different area that we have to sort of contain ourselves in once we've been tested. Um, so it's all, yeah, it's all a little strange and a little unusual. Um, so the athletes have their own area to warm up, their own 
portaloos so just the same portaloo queue that you guys would have but just mm -hmm. far less people <laughs> there's just a <laughs> uh, a smaller field of uh, elite athletes using these portaloos and that's about it but um yeah nothing nothing particularly exciting it's just quite unusual just the different processes you have to follow um you always have to check in for your event as well so there's uh that's usually about maybe about an hour before your event you have to check in and then there's different call rooms of which you have to be there on time if you're not yeah. there then you're scratched from the race um so that's always very strict as well and by the minute so it might be that you're Racing in the portaloo queue <laughs> yeah so there is always a bit of a, a stress i think for athletes you can see people panicking and getting their spikes and running through to the the call room to make sure that they're on time because if you're racing it i don't know 8 32 p.m you have to be in the call room by 8 11 okay. p.m so there's always a bit of a oh i need to make sure i'm there before yeah. and then once you're in there you have to get you get your bibs when you're in there now as well um, the, again, they used to be handed out beforehand. So there's a little bit of added stress and panic when you're in there to make sure everything, you've got your bibs, you have your spikes, um, you have all your belongings with you and you're you're ready to go. How do you cope with eating when you're watching a race? When you're, when you're, I was thinking of myself eating, watching you racing. <laughs> How do you cope with eating during the day when you know you've got a, when you're racing at that time of night? Um, I think I'm quite lucky in that I'm not too nervous during the day I'm not someone that thinks and thinks and thinks about the race I try to distract myself just with my general day I'm lucky I have Michael with me most of the time so we'll just go about our normal day and chill out and watch Netflix and try to distract my mind a little bit um, I suppose it's only really when I get to the event that that's when the nerves start to become a little bit more real and by that point to be honest I probably don't eat anything within the last certainly within the last two hours before a race sometimes maybe three hours before nothing um, no no gel or anything no i'll have like probably about two hours before i'll have something like um yeah whether it's peanut butter and a bit of banana on a rice cake or whether it's a, a chia charge bar or something like that something granola -y about maybe two to three hours before um, but actually after that, I won't, I won't really have much at all. Um, even fluid wise, I don't like to take on a huge amount of fluid again to try and avoid those portaloos. So <laughs> I just, um, within the last three hours, that's really when I'm get down to the track, do my warm up, prepare for the race before that I'll have probably about four hours out. I'll have a, a bigger meal. So if I'm racing the evening, that'll be something pretty plain. It'll be chicken, rice, um, yeah something pretty there's bland to be honest no risk. yeah it depends where i am like if i'm at a competition you don't get the choice of that what you eat i mean you get given whatever you get given and you, you eat it so i'm quite flexible with regards to what i have on race day it's not like i have to be so regimented and strict because if i travel to japan i'll get fed something entirely different mm -hmm. to if i'm in the uk or in the usa yeah. so you have to be pretty flexible with what you can eat on race day but i do find that most athletics events will have pasta rice chicken like it's pretty staple <laughs> <laughs> um, I always have porridge pots with me, so I'll have porridge pretty much every race day. Um, that's that's I just take it all over the world with me. So at least that's the one meal I know that I'll have consistent. Um, but yeah, I'd say for a big competition like that, I'd be main meal sort of about four and a bit hours out from the race. Yeah. Um, yeah, snack maybe two three hours out, and then that's me really to to race day till race race moment. <clears throat> cool. Going back to Japan, uh, when <clears throat> are you, would you enter, say, some kind of COVID secure bubble in, in the build-up? Would there be a time scale for that, or is that pretty flexible at the yeah. moment? <laughs> to be honest, I think uh, the answer to that is nobody really knows <laughs> what what we're actually going into. Um, yeah. We're still waiting to find out a lot of those answers from not just UK Athletics, but more the, the British Olympic Association, because that's, it falls under their sort of jurisdiction for this competition. So we're still waiting to hear a lot of information as to what that is going, look, going to look like, um, yeah. whether... I know a lot of athletes will be going out around two weeks before their event and we'll actually be based in Yokohama rather than in Tokyo itself. So that's where athletics will be. Um, I'm not sure if I am going to go out the two weeks before. I think I might go a little bit closer to my event. Um, again, just because it's a long time to go out sort of two weeks before without any of your normal 
support team there. Like I'm used to having Michael with me for yeah. training purposes. Every day he's on the bike. He's always helping with my coaching. Um, so it'd be a long time to go into a, a bubble and not have that normal setup that you're used to. So it's also obviously going to be um, very, very strict on COVID testing as well. I think we're tested every morning and every evening. So yeah. again, two weeks of that, it might be a little bit draining. Um, so I'd like to try and limit, I suppose, my uh chances of, of picking up anything because again it's yeah. all about yeah. risk mm, uh, what, what risk can you limit as much as you can so for me i think i might look to go out maybe just a week um, and yeah. perhaps 10 days maximum before my my event just to minimize that risk um and just try and stick into a good routine as much as i can out here in front of we're training really yeah. well at the moment things are going really good so um uk athletics arrive actually today the rest of the uh, the altitude athletes anyway yeah. that will be coming out so from today onwards there'll be physiologists here there will be physiotherapists massage therapists um yeah there'll be a, a bit more of a support now built in from from today onwards right up to tokyo yeah, I was really curious, actually, once you'd booked your ticket, your relationship with, like, say, UK Athletics, did that <clears throat> kind of ramp up, I suppose, because now you are off, off to Japan? Is that a bit more intense and they're coming around to take measures and kit and stuff like that and getting you fitted up yeah. for the Team GB kit? <laughs> yeah, it's a weird one because I, I suppose I, um, for most of the training camps this year, obviously, I, I operate pretty solo it's myself and michael and, and that's it we travel to different altitude locations and sort of do our own thing but as soon as you make the team um i suppose you are uh, meant to go on the official team gb camp um mm. i suppose just to ensure that everything's in place all the protocols are in place and you're supported as as you should be up to the games um we had actually the the camp was actually meant to be in san Moritz, switzerland and we decided oh. that we were going to come to, to font Rameau instead. So we were actually going to have a separate camp to the GB one, but because of um, COVID again, yeah. um, they, they had to cancel the, their plans in Switzerland due to the um, travel barrier block, whatever you want to call it at the moment. Yeah. They, don't, they don't want anyone in. They don't want to Yeah, see pretty them. much. Or they don't want anyone from the UK anyway. No. And Aust so, the Australians uh, can go. I've listened to a different <laughs> podcast and they I think they're off there to uh, Switzerland for their training camp. Yeah, so there's a lot, there are a lot of athletes there because it is brilliant for running, but we just felt the, personally, we felt the weather would be a little bit warmer in some, and uh, font remote. It's a lot more consistent here, usually. I see yeah. that in the middle <laughs> of thunderstorms. Yeah. And getting lightning. darker and darker. <laughs> um, but yeah, usually it is, it is very sort of nice here. It's warm and it's, it is good weather. But um, so that was our decision for coming here. But I suppose by fate, actually, it's worked out quite well because now all the, the GB team will be coming here. So we'll have a supported camp, which makes a big difference having physiotherapists and um, having that support right up to the game. So, um, yeah, I haven't had any of my kit. Sadly, I won't get the chance to do kitting out. Um, yeah. It's just been unfortunate the days that they had the the kit on i was already out here so okay. i came straight out pretty much after my last competition in in france and drove up here to font Rameau. so um i mean i could have gone back but it, again with quarantine rules and disruption it just it yeah. wasn't worth the hassle of going back so sadly i won't get the experience of like kicking out and doing all yeah. the fun things i'm just going to get mine bundled into a bag and and <laughs> sent to france for me but um i have been to two games so i'm not yeah. i'm not too greedy about it it's one of those things like i've i feel very fortunate i've been through the process before it, yeah. it is good fun it's always part of the experience but um yeah, it's a different game this time around and yeah. I am really focused on performing at my best in my ability in Tokyo. So if that means for going a couple of days in, in the UK, then then yeah, so be it. Well, I know we've only got a short time with you, Alicia. That's why I'm like, I just want to ask. So what does your uh, training for this last build-up look like? How do you go about getting that like extra 10%? Um, do you know what? It doesn't actually change a huge amount. I think there's... I suppose by this point, I think had I had I come to Font Rameau and not been in shape, then yeah, we might have had to change things and tweak things. But at this moment in time, I, I really am in the best shape I've yeah. ever been in. So yeah, that's why I was wondering what how you managed yeah. to hold on to that, not go too far. Um, I suppose I I just know from 
the the training and the racing phase that we've just come out of i feel like i've had a really good little stint racing i actually have a race um on what day is today monday i leave tomorrow for a race um in oslo so it'll be my last my first and last uh 5000 meters sort of at that level like at a diamond league level we haven't yeah. had any this year so I was a bit sort of umming and ahhing, do I do it? Do I not? Do I go into this training block? But I think it's actually really important that I get the chance to race some of the fastest girls in the world before we go to Tokyo. And I, I haven't had that chance this year because, again, the race cancellations and the women's 5K has just been removed pretty much from all the Diamond League. So this is the one event that is going ahead before the Games. And so... I'm, I'm going to race there just because I think it's important. I think it will really bring me on and give me a good insight into the, the the speed that they're going to go in Tokyo. And I think I need that sort of level of competition. So that will be my last race. Um, and then, yeah, we'll get into probably a good sort of two, three weeks of, of training again. Um, nothing too crazy. I'll do a bit more, I suppose, bulky training, a bit more volume in there over the first two weeks just to try and top up, I suppose, from the, the endurance side of things that we've maybe not been doing over the, this racing period. Um, and then, to be honest, the last two weeks is really about sharpening up and just resting up. There's yeah. not a huge amount I'll do in those final two weeks before competition. Um, I think, for me, part of it is the work is already done uh, as such. Like, I'm in good shape. I'm running really well in training. Um, the altitude is like another added factor to that. So I don't need to be pushing, pushing, pushing all the time now. I think I just need to maintain as much as I can, as you yeah. said. And uh, if anything, start to freshen up towards the end because it's been a, a really tough year of training and racing. And I think adapting to the heat and humidity is going to be another factor as well. Um, I'll have a good sort of week to 10 days when I go to Tokyo, but we've been very fortunate here to have a, a heat chamber too. So I'll be doing a little bit of work in there just to try and um, just cross training at the moment, just cycling and cross training again, just to try and get my body acclimatized to what it's going to be like so that it's not a huge shock going from uh 10 degrees here to going to 30 degrees in tokyo because it's yeah. it, the weather unfortunately in Fort Rimo hasn't been as as nice as we sort of predicted it would be in the summer um but we're very fortunate here to use the facilities like that and they have world-class facilities here in Fort Rimo. so um yeah very grateful to be using those too excellent talking about facilities i know you don't really know what the facility is going to be like in tokyo as far as the village is concerned but your previous two two of the games what have they been like you know the food the combination special treatment any kind of wild parties after certain <laughs> events have finished and stuff like that <laughs> spill the beans right. it's always really strange for athletics because we are like the last event that go on and endurance athletes because we use altitude we're always the last to go in as well so um i'm trying to think for i mean for real by the time i got to the village which was like the third last day or fourth last day of the event yeah. of the Olympics actually <clears throat> happening, I'd missed everything. So I'd missed all of the swimming. I'd missed all the other events. So yeah. it, it's very, very strange just going in so late. Um, I'd say that all the, the teams had already been like parting away for probably about a week <laughs> by the time I got to uh, the village and was like just starting to prepare for my competition. So it is a bit of a strange one. Um, I'd say London 2012 was an incredible experience. They just put so many resources into making sure that that village was something like pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Rio didn't, didn't have the same sort of uh, pizzazz is what London did but yeah. I think that again probably goes down to the the finances that they had that just wasn't unfortunately supported in the same way that, yeah. that London was London made sure really that everyone had a, a games to remember um, logistically there was a lot of problems with transport in Rio and okay. um, yeah which I a lot of people got sick as well. There was a lot of sickness going around. Like Michael was sick as a dog. He oh my picked goodness. up something, I think two days before his event and I didn't see him for a week because he was just so, so sick. And my roommate was the same. Beth Porter got really sick before her event. So the doctors got sick, the physios got sick. So <laughs> that put a little bit of a diner on things. Uh, everyone was in like different little quarantine sections yeah. with the hotel. 
Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a, a different uh, experience to London, but it is cool to be part of the village. Like if it's your first Olympic games, it's such an eye opener. Like there's yeah. uh, just a massive food hall, like the size of so many football courts and there's a McDonald's that's just open 24 seven and all free and you just go and order whatever you want. And then there's oh food from all different corners of the world. So any cuisine you ever could think of is in this sort of pavilion for food. And then they have, um, yeah, like a bank, a hairdresser, a nail salon, a dentist. Like it is a, like a world within a little bubble. I suppose a village, yeah, a whole village within a village. So um, sounds amazing. It's a cool experience. Yeah, it really is cool to be part of. Um, I think this time will be certainly very, very different. Um, yeah. I think everything will be very regimented to you go to eat at this time and then the rest of the time you just spend in your your room. I don't think there'll be very much mixing between other countries and that's part and parcel of it as well as getting to meet other people from other places all over the world that do different yeah. events and you swap little pins and do you know I mean that's part of the Olympic Games but sadly I think um, that side of things will be very much restricted. It's just... Unfortunately, it's just the way that we are. The, the world yeah. is right now. You have to accept that, that there are going to be changes. And at the end of the day, you're still feeling very grateful that the event is going ahead. It's hosted. Um, at one point, it looked very doubtful it was even going to happen. So, yeah, yeah I'm really grateful that it's just it's happening and um, that the athletes will get a chance to showcase all of the work they've put in now over the last two years. Dreams will be realized. People yeah. will make their first team. It might be their last team for some people. Um, so I think all of that sort of special side of the Olympics, the emotions, the heartbreak, all of those things will still be there, which is yeah. part and parcel of the Olympics. And and in a way, I think it probably will end up being one of the most watched games as well, because people yeah. will be set home with not a huge amount to do either. <laughs> so although the athletes will be sort of boxed up in their rooms with not a lot to do, I think people at home will be really supporting. And um, yeah, I'm just excited now to, to get out there and experience it all. Do you know who you're going to be roommates with? I don't yet, actually. I'm, I, again, that's another thing. I'm not sure if we will be placed in in separate rooms now because of the, yeah. the sort of strict protocols. Um, all of this year, I haven't shared a room at all. So if there's anything good that's come from, <laughs> from COVID, it's been not getting sick on airplanes is a big one. I yeah. don't know how I've managed it this year, but um, I've avoided all illnesses, which for me is is pretty good. And um, yeah, not sharing a room at a Diamond League, it's been so, or any race, to be honest, it's been great. Um, get your own bed, you don't have to share, you can get wake up whenever you want, uh, you can go to sleep whenever you want, you can sleep right through without any, anyone judging you. Yeah. Like it is really, it's uh, it's been great. So I'm not sure if that little trend will be broken at the Olympics. I think you might have to have one roommate. I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see how, how that goes. Uh, since we last spoke to you, Leash, we've started to finish the podcast interviews with five quick fire questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to fire these off to you and you've got to answer as quickly as you can. Gary right. thought the questions, so if they're rubbish, blame <sighs> Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. Uh, your fave takeaway? Oh, um, anything Japanese, I think. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's lucky, isn't it? <laughs> calm, calm driver or road rager? Uh, I'd say calm driver. Boyfriend Gar is road rager. He's the passenger seat going mad, <laughs> but I'm calm. <laughs> I love it. Favorite movie? Oh, oh my God. Oh, could be any in the top five. It's a hard question. Maybe the Green Mile. I remember watching that as a kid, and it's just something that's like I don't know. It's like an iconic movie. It's stuck mm. with me. Quite depressing one there to pick that, but there you go. It's the first one I can think of. <laughs> FaceTime or phone call? Um, FaceTime. It's a modern girl. Mm. Snow or sun? Oh, sun. Oh, easy. God. Easy. Very easy. easy. Have you had a <laughs> Have you had a hailstorm? Um, have you had a hailstorm yet at Font Rameau the last week? Yeah, we we started out literally one of the first days we were here. It went from twenty four degrees, crop top and shorts. We were like, oh great, this is beautiful. Like this is exactly what we wanted. Um, we got about seven mile into a 10 mile run and like Michael looked up and it was just black. Like the oh, sky wow. was black, <laughs> and um, it, it went. It dropped to about 
I think it was under 10 degrees in the end. It was absolutely Baltic. And oh hailstones were like this. They were massive. They about knocked me out. Um, but we survived. So <laughs> at least it's, skin is, is waterproof. So we survived it's that. It's balmy, least. isn't it? It's yeah, balmy. To drop from 24 to 7 or something, it was bonkers. Honestly, we were absolutely freezing. <laughs> and just wondering why the hell we had travelled out here when we could have just <laughs> stayed yeah. in, in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> oh well Elise thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to us we oh, yeah, loved thanks. all those little nuggets of information and we will be best of luck on Wednesday at the Diamond League yeah good luck I'll be thank watching you. Thank you. eating my tea and um, we'll follow your build up to the Olympics and good luck yeah. with the journey and getting there in one piece and uh, go smash it yeah go oh, thank you so much no great thanks, to catch Chief. up with you guys thanks for calling thanks cheers thanks bye bye Bye. 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 Thanks, Alish. Very generous of you to give up your time. You know, my goodness, mate, must be super busy for an hour as she builds up to Tokyo. So, yeah, thank you very much from everyone at Rudley Hills. I loved it. Little chat again. It's great to catch up with a bit top. Top flight athletes, so thanks very much. Gary, in the spirit of um, Ross Jenkins' four rounds in four different uh, countries, wanted to try and find uh, uh, improve your geography knowledge, basically, this week, didn't you? <laughs> My geography, yeah. <laughs> So you, instead of just mentioning uh, races around Durham and Newcastle, <laughs> you did a bit more research this week. So what have we got? The Salomon Serpent Trail, which is in the South Downs, national park there's a few actually from what i saw and i think it was si entries there's various events so that looked pretty interesting and then in wales you've got the north canham canham i'm not too sure how you pronounce that so again that'll be good uh glen great glen ultra up in scotland and the anna long horseshoe in northern ireland so yeah good luck to everybody Toy in the line this weekend. And if you're doing one of those races, yeah, share some Instagram posts. We'd love to see the trails. What you got coming up this week? You did a little bit of faster running, did you, Gary, this week? I saw something in it with a seven minute mile on Strava. Yeah, she put a bit of effort in. Uh, yeah, yesterday was, it's really confusing at the moment because I've got this St. Cuthbert's Way coming up, but then I've also got this big commitment to this Bob Graham round support this weekend. So I'm kind of doing to last week of taper so i'm treating this week like the last week of a race um and then next week will be the same and basically on that <clears throat> on that plan there'd be say five times three minutes or something like that or maybe the, the two mile at marathon pace so i did last night just and i got together and we did the five times three minutes which is i think it's 10k pace with um two minute rest so it's quite generous it's a jog rest though. so but what we do you know you mentioned earlier about standing still so what i would do normally is I'd stand still until my heart rate got to maybe 140 and then we'd start jogging um, then. And uh, yeah, that went pretty well. Um, it was a bit of a shock to run fast, <laughs> to run fast again. Did you warm up into it? Did you feel as you got through those three minutes, you felt better? No, it was straight up. <laughs> All of the splits were, I think, 551 or something like that. That was, I suppose, the mile pace if you'd have yeah. been going for a mile. Um and I think the last one was the fastest because two blocks together running. That's uh, my difference in my splits when I do sessions like is incredible. I am with 10 or 15 seconds faster in the last one, nearly uh, always than I cannot, <laughs> cannot uh, seem to get my body moving and on a, until like 60 minutes into a session. <laughs> well, I was over, I was done in 60 minutes. <laughs> Oh, didn't so yeah that was nice actually to get that done a, a little bit more um focused and i've not been feeling great so i was a bit worried how that was going to go i just snivelly full of calls um but yeah it went fine so and i've uh, emailed the race directors at st cuthbert's where you have two choices with the waves to basically um you can do the early start which is a bit more forgiving if you're taking time to make the tide at the right time or you can do the later start if you can kind of think you can move that quick over that terrain. So just and I, we could completely regret this, but we've decided to go for the late, later start. So we have to basically do about 60 miles in, I think it's about 13 hours. Um, 
which is moving. It's not, you know, you're not, you're not hanging around. Um, I could completely, we might be talking about a DNF on in a couple of weeks time on the show, <laughs> but you know, I just think I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't want to sandbag people saying, I'm going to take it easy. I'm not going to do that, but it's definitely not a race. You know, I've got, I had the Bob Graham run, obviously I've got big, I've got 10 hours on the high fails this, this weekend. So the race will be what it is, but I will try and turn up and, and do, you know. Put your good... racing daps on. Yeah. Do, do your best. But, but I'm it's not going to be much nicer to be moving forward through the field than to be starting in that wave one and be at the front where. Yeah, I wouldn't be yeah. curious, actually. They get a two hour head start. It's not head start, but they start two hours. Yeah, yeah. So by so... halfway, you're going to start ticking off the bat markers, aren't yeah. you? And then. I think that would be a much nicer way to do it. I think you're fitter than you think you are. Yeah, I, I, and I'll be, you know, I'll have a super easy week next week. I can't argue. I've got my, um, my legs must be as conditioned as they've ever been for going up and down hills. Um, maybe not the speed uh, that I would normally have, but I'm going to turn up and I'll do as good as I can on the day. And that's, I'm not going to stress about it though. It's simple no. as that. What else? It doesn't sound about? like you're stressing about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hopefully, yeah, we, hopefully Ian Leach, the guy I'm supporting the Bob Grimm round on, he'll have a successful Bob and in the evening, or we'll hopefully too enjoy. Are you going to be back in time for the football? Yeah, we're going to steer the night, but check in at the YJ is not until five. So Neil and I didn't fancy being minging all day in Keswick. <laughs> so I we think we're yeah. going to, we're just going to come home and what, you know, watch the football and a bit of uh, tennis too, probably. So that's there's too much now. Last night, there was too much. There's football, there's tennis, there's Tour de France. Do you watch a bit of the Tour de France? No, I, I would. If it was on, I'd quite easily get drawn into it. But um, I love like those highlights. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just pretty much as I come down the stairs from saying, good night, my little angels. I only wish you didn't have to go to bed now because i could spend more time Jump with you pop. <laughs> <laughs> and Bryn goes dinner's ready and we turn on the tour de france highlights and uh yeah i love it i love two hours later <laughs> they <to> wake up <laughs> yeah, but the tennis like... is wonderful you know oh, the tennis we popped the tennis on last night and um i wasn't really that bothered but then i was just glued to the tennis I fantastic. love the noise of that tennis. It's, it's again, it's excellent for napping too. Though. Do you think there's ever? I chat with Lisa about this. Sometimes I love watching football, but sometimes the match is quite boring. I don't ever remember watching a boring tennis match. I think when I was younger, a mum used to have Wimbledon on. I'd be like, "What?" I mean, but we had like a little black and white TV, didn't you? When you had to get up and twizzle, oh, God, Dad yeah. used to have the stickers stuck on with the right aerial thing for the channel. <laughs> uh, I don't think I could see it great, but. Um, now, no, I mean, you just get into it, don't you? Don't know any of these people apart from no. Andy Murray, but um, I just love watching the, the the incredible athletic feat that they can get that ball back over the net. Well, I struggle to do an underarm serve and get it over the net. <laughs> <laughs> How did they, you know, the from the eye to the brain to the hand? In... I mean, years and years and years of conditioning, isn't it? I've got my kids on the tennis circuit already. They get, they get tennis lessons because it's such good because out here, we do, they don't do any. I mean, they play football, the boys, but ha that hand-eye coordination, something that uh, if you live That's in Xbox, the mountains. Oh, Karen. <laughs> That's what George. Uh, we don't have good enough Wi-Fi for anything like that. <laughs> All right, yes. Yeah. Like, right, you need to be able to play some sort of ball sport, not just to put on skis and go down a mountain really fast on various forms of equipment. Uh, but I wish I could play tennis better. It's a good sport. Oh, a what good about sport. yourself? What have you got coming up? I've got one more week of training before taper time. <laughs> and my, I just had a catch-up with my coach just before this, and he's like, I'm a bit nervous, you know, about your taper you know you're going to be able to like not train i was like you know i am going to embrace that because the last thing i want to do is go into a 40k 3000 meter hard run with any being a bit tired yeah i want to be starting that lineup wanting to rip off everybody's heads and destroy. do you uh have you looked at who's racing do you know this the no i never look can care less because pss, i just see something in a score i'll chase it up the mountain nice. uh, <laughs> I, it's only a local race, you know, so it's not going to be a massive field. Doesn't but matter. I always say that. But then they Elbows turn out. up. 
these little goats that uh, uh, I'm all right on the flat. I'm all right on the, the downhill. I have to absolutely destroy myself to try and keep up with some of those girls. So those three uh, minute kilometers, Eddie. Those three minutes. I don't think there's any part of this course is going to be more than like a 17 minute kilometer. Um, but uh, I'm excited to finish this block. Yeah, a few little sharpening sessions. Come. I'm doing a race simulation tomorrow. So full race kit, race pack. Two at race breakfast, two hours at race pace. Basically, just out of breath for two hours. You know, like you saw in Western States. I'm gonna. Yeah, channel. yeah. I wonder how many people have channeled the inner Beth Pascal this week when they. I certainly have. Oh, wow, yeah, three minutes. Yeah, so I'm gonna do two hours at race pace. See how that feels, and then lots of little sharp sessions next week. Trying to not overdo it, which is my forte. And the kids are on their nine week holiday. Nine oh, weeks. Nine weeks of summer holidays. <laughs> oh, they were like, we can't wait, Mom. I was like, me too. It's going to be great. Uh, so we're just waiting to hear whether we're going to be allowed to come back to England at some point and see the family and do some see some mates. But who knows? Otherwise, I mean, I can't ever complain about summer in the mountains because mm. we have it on our doorstep. And so there's always something to do or just hanging out. We just go for a hike with a picnic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you might be, if, if you come over, you might not be able to get back though. You've got to be careful. <laughs> Sometimes these, we see in yeah. England, see on the news that people go on holiday, then they've got to quickly find a flight to come back to England before the window yeah. shuts. Yeah, I'd be like, mum and dad, we're here till Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll be so pleased to see us. But then like August, <laughs> after about five days, they're like, yeah. so no, what time were you leaving? <laughs> Yep, that's it. So uh, we've we've done a host of interviews. Um, so we've got loads of interesting stuff lined up. Lots of um, good guests. Guests we haven't heard up from before, which is a bit more tech, a bit more um, kit to talk to. We've got some brands coming on, which would be good for our bonus shows. I can't wait. Uh, you, you're good on all that brand stuff as well. If you like what you hear, which we we understand that, I mean, people are going crazy for the podcast. Uh, we ask for you to like, share, subscribe on your listening platform and leave us a, well, hey, people always say leave us a five-star review. I don't think you can tell people how many stars they have to give us. I don't want a two-star review, Eddie. No. So if you're going to give less than five, don't bother. Um, and if you're going to tell me I talk too much and that I tell people that I live in France too much, I'm not interested. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> if you do like the show and you want to keep us in employment, give us a like, give us a follow, give us a shout out. Right, Gary, you have a great match. Good, great match. <laughs> You're playing for England. <laughs> years ago, I could have got a game. Oh, oh, stop it. He's just like my husband. And do you watch the game as well going, oh, for goodness sake, why did you pass it? He's open wide. You're there. You... This is terrible. I'm like, oh, my God. I don't. I, you know what? It's funny on social media. I just saw all these people, all these experts, Harry Kane's this, Harry Kane's that, so-and-so's this, so and Gary Southgate's rubbish. <laughs> and about a minute later, Harry Kane scored. Harry Kane's get ineffective, get him off. And he scores his goal. <laughs> it, nobody knows what they're doing. And I, all the money in the world, I wouldn't want to swap with Gary Southgate <gasps> in that moment of time. You can't put yourself in that position. You can't imagine how that the pressure of oh. that game... I played the Busa finals in hockey when I was at university. Mm. And uh, and I remember falling apart, the pressure, the nerves. And that was nothing, really. <laughs> but I remember, like, when I'd get the ball, I'd be, like, shake My hockey stick would be, like, <laughs> shaking, trying to control the ball. Because they were like, ooh, 500 people watching. Yeah. 550 million. <laughs> <laughs> but even, like, the build-up to the Bob Graham round, I didn't know what shoes to wear, let alone decide on the national team. It's uh, <laughs> not for oh, me. Don't worry. I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think he's going to message you. You'll be all right. He's not right. in my phone book, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, five quick questions. Oh, my God. So we, we have a, uh, we've introduced to our interviews just to make them even more exciting and deep and meaningful. Five quick five. Five, five quick fire questions to ask, um, <laughs> to ask interviewees at the end. People are going crazy to them. People are loving them. And we're oh. amusing ourselves by thinking of things. And I thought, so I said to Gary, let's think of things to ask each other. And I thought of so many inappropriate things. I was like snorting across the table, laughing, going, I wish I'd asked Gary. <laughs> I that. knew you'd be laughing. <laughs> I just could just see. 
<laughs> so I toned it. I did say to Bryn, can I say this? And he's like, you can't say poor Gary. You can't say that. Should I, I go see, first? You see what Should you I go want. first? <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> Pants or socks? Socks. <laughs> Mustache or beard? Neither, but <laughs> beard. Food or drink? Food. Oh, yeah. Jam or pickle? Pickle. Oh, interesting. A jam for a jam. I Rat like or mouse? Mouse. <laughs> Pete, you've all learned something about Gary that you didn't know. Oh, my, the, the uh, digital analysts will be having the field here with that. My uh, getting spammed with uh, mouse. Pickled mouse. <laughs> Pickled mice. <laughs> Come on, Eddie, are you ready? I've got some yeah. for you. Oh, my God. Have you ever broke the law? Unwittingly or deliberately? Oh, my God. I don't think I have. Oh, yes, we got put in a police car once when we were at university because we we dug up some flowers from the um from oh, one of those disrespecting the Durham. And then the policeman got us in the car, but we asked if we could bring the flowers and we sat in the back. In the end, they drove around, they chucked us out because we were twittering on and on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, God, yeah, flower stealer. Russell Crowe or Russell Brand? Or Russell Crowe <laughs> any day of the week. Do you remember? Your first gig? Oh, yes. Will Young went to a Will Young concert. And ah, I, had a, ah, <laughs> I had a cup of Earl Grey tea. I don't know why that's so funny. <laughs> we, we sat down. This is when me and my husband were courting. We sat down and we realised we were the youngest people by about yeah. 30 years. And that everyone was having a cup of tea. So we joined in. Oh, I God. did then go to a Brian Adams one a few weeks later, so slightly better, but not sure it's even that much better. much better. <laughs> Anyone famous in your phone book? I like this one. Gosh. Really famous. Well, I thought Ross Jenkins had a good one in his phone well, book. He had, yeah, well, I've got also, who have I got? Uh, Beth Pascal. Um, mm. Who gave me their number? I was like, oh, God, I'm just a quick look. You might have to pause it for a second. Need some music for this gap. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, that's quite nice singing. Oh, I think that's the limit. That's not bad. I know. I'm sure I can do better. Last I'm one. Actually, I'm not sure I can. Yeah, we need some more. We need to. We. I've got a lot of running, running people. Nobody of any <laughs> other caliber. We need to branch out. <laughs> Pity party or problem solver. Or oh, in the depths of both. I go deep into the pity party, <laughs> deep into that, and maybe a bit of drama at the same time. And then... That's every drama, show, isn't it? <laughs> pretty much. It's a, it's a whole well of emotions. And then I try and prob problem solve. That's a good one. What are you, pity party party or problem solver? You're problem right. solver. You're not. There's no pity. In there no, I don't. I don't do that kind of thing. I've got one more question for you. When you when are you going to crew this Bob Graham round? Are you going to be like a taskmaster? Are you going to be like, come on? Or are you going to be sort of the quiet? You know what? I just assess the runner. And that'll, that'll determine how I play it on the day. That's my... That's Have my you done history. a crewing for Bob Graham round before? <clears throat> well, yeah, one really bad. Um, oh, I... yeah. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> I, I feel like I've done two. Oh yeah, and with uh, David Johnson, Sarah McCormack uh, on leg two, and you know what, David Johnson, I was just a bottle carrier and a food carrier. He he knew exactly what he was doing, and Sarah was pretty assured too. So yeah, I was just there handing him Snickers and a drink every every now and again. <laughs> well, if I if I was going to have crude, wouldn't you, Gary? There by my side. That's a lovely thing for you to say to end the show. <laughs> and what was that? My goodness, that was episode 44. I hope you enjoyed it, everybody. I had a really lovely chat today. I enjoyed today. Thank you very much for the company. And that's it. My name's Gary Thwaites. I'm Eddie Sutton. And let's run to the hills.